How's it going, Charles Botenston? We are going to be having a new series on, say, mini classes, things that people have talked to us in the past, whether it's a foreign investor, which we're dealing with a couple right now, and or someone that's actually looking to buy outside of New York City, and they come in, they say, what kind of process is this? This is crazy. Co-ops and, and the banks and the approval and debt to income ratio and post-closing liquidity. So we're going to be talking about foreign investors today. Obviously, there is a lot of foreign investors coming in from Europe, Asia, South America, and one of the biggest questions you obviously have to do is sit down with them and obviously you have to talk about what we're going to be talking about right now so number one is let's just start with the elephant in the room which is do you buy a condo or a co-op so obviously the aspects within foreign investing is a little bit different with the government with the irs and we're going to be talking about all that with co-ops and condos so with co-ops obviously there's board approval we have a co-op right now that we actually have someone that's going to be gifting money and that they are not actually a u.s citizen right now they're going to be coming to u.s citizen so you have to run all these things by the board which is it, they don't have as many assets in the United States so in case they default or in case they don't start paying their make their maintenance they actually are legally allowed to go after the person obviously because they owe money but the problem is if they don't have any assets they have no income they have no bank account in the United States it's really hard to go after them so in co-ops obviously you have to run it by the co-op you have to run it by the board highly recommend that you don't even look at co-ops unless you explain this to the person to the actual either for a national or to the foreign investor because the reason being is that they haven't experienced this co-ops are very unique maybe they're a little bit different outside of new york city or anywhere else but they're used to condos or homes or individual buildings or things like that so the first thing is the board approval the second thing is the lease restriction so a lot of people are also not used to this is that sometimes the co-op takes a percentage of the profit and the reason they do this is because they don't want a certain amount of investors there's a multitude of reasons behind that. Number one is if it gets to such a high point of investors, banks don't lend. The second one is obviously homeowners and shareholders actually treat the building way better than actual people that are renting. People that are renting, they don't care if they, about the parties or the condition of the building. They do, but not as much because they know that it's not theirs. They don't own it. It's someone else's property. There's a lease restrictions. There's a couple of fees, an annual fee. There's a monthly fee. So an annual fee, 10% of the annual rent. Monthly fee, which is 20% of the maintenance. The tenant must be approved, which obviously there's fees behind that. There's a move-in fee, move-out fee. Then you kind of just, you know, prop up the coffers of the co-op. As I like to say, they shake you down a little bit. The terminal lease, obviously is just a month. It's in Albany about Airbnb. When that decision is gonna come down, it really depends. I'm assuming who gives more money, Airbnb or the hotel lobbying. And to be honest for me is that I don't think even if it comes down to Airbnb is allowed, I don't know how many buildings are actually gonna allow it because they make not only a ton of money on the hotel tax, I think it's 3%, roughly, I think it's like 3.25% hotel tax per night, per room. So the city makes a lot of money, to say the least. You can only rent it out a fixed number of years. And the last thing is each person has to be. So if you buy into a co-op, you have to be approved. Your whole scenario has to be approved that I'm looking to rent this out. And obviously each person that rents there has to also be approved. So the amount of money that co-ops garner on a monthly rate is much lower. You have to do, and we'll be talking about that. You have to do your research on that. Sometimes with the, the board application for tenants, they have personal guarantees, maintenance and escrow, recommendation letters. You have to go through the exact, or the tenant has to go through the exact same process. Condominiums, obviously let's move on to them. That's everyone's bread and butter. Unfortunately, that's only about 31% of the marketplace right now. Yes, as more condos come online and, and more co-ops are converted to condos, either they're destroyed or people just, <laughs> nobody really likes co-ops even though it kind of, saved New York City in the financial crisis. So obviously condos will start with the basics. It's real property, you could easily transfer it. So real property is that you own that property. All the, all the little walls that you, that you actually own, not only the property, you can renovate it easier. They can't say no, the condo can't say no. And obviously when tenants have to go through the board process, but they can't get a no, they would have to rent it out or the, the board would actually have to rent it out at the price that you want to rent it out. In other words, they have to take over the lease. If you're buying, it's the first right of refusal and the condo actually has to buy the property. So leasing units, I have it right here is Again, one year lease cannot be, some of them can't be more than a year. Yes, there's a 
you know, kind of a, a renewal. We just went through that right now, which is one of the properties that we manage. It's it's one year and then they said, well, for the second year, let's lock in the rate. Brilliant idea by the tenant, the owner, obviously they said, you know, we'll do $75 more. So we went back to the tenant, the tenant agreed with that. So we have one year at certain amount of price, then the second year at $75 and there's an option to renew for a third year. The last thing is I'll, I'll cover really quick are two areas that a lot of people don't know as much, which is sponsor units. Sponsor units are essentially the original owner of the building that if it was a rental building and then it went to co-op or sponsor units where they built the building and it's a new development or a new conversion, they don't need to abide by the exact same rules of either selling it or renting it out. So if it's a co-op, you don't actually have to go through, and obviously, yes, it is case by case, but you don't have to go through the exact same rules and regulations as if it were a regular shareholder. Some of them actually the sponsor unit rights, so the rights of a, a sponsor unit sometimes pass between owners, but typically it doesn't. And the last thing is with condops. Condops is a co-op that has condo rules, okay? They usually have higher maintenance and obviously they're run like a co-op, but they have condo rules. So in other words, the, the tax structure and everything else. Let's just talk about really quick. Obviously when you are a foreign investor or any investor, you're gonna be having a ton of closing costs. We're gonna be having a separate video about this. You have the, the, mo the mortgage, the loan, the board application, title insurance, mortgage premium, some of them obviously divvy up between condos and co-ops, mortgage recording tax, mansion tax, city and state transfer taxes, sponsor fees, managing agent fees, closing fees. So we'll have a, an entire video about closing fees, but if you are financing, the deal that we're in right now, they're not financing, they are cash. We have another deal that they are financing and they're putting down 30%. Actually, they might be putting down more. They might be putting 35 or 40% down. We want that because in case it doesn't appraise or, you know, there's, and they're not contingent on financing. So the banks that you really wanna to go to, this section is all about financing. The banks you wanna to go to, obviously HSBC, that's international. I, I think TD is Canadian. So you wanna go potentially to the bank that actually is the, and, and this is the thing, you wanna to go to the originating country's bank, okay? But if they have obviously a satellite office or anything else in the United States, that co-ops are not gonna say, oh yeah, no, you can, you can finance with someone outside of the country, say Canada or say China or Japan or something like that, because there's no recourse in case they, they stop paying maintenance. There's no recourse if they stop paying common charges. So this is all case by case. Obviously, they're, they're concerned about going after the borrower. Banks are, are concerned about going through going after the borrower in case they default. Here's some underwriting regulations. Obviously, they may have changed. They may change in the future, so I don't know when you're watching this, but you have to understand that it's typically 50% down, 50% loan, loan to value ratio. That's something that you talk to your bank about. Maximum loan amount, 1.5 million. Minimum deposit in the bank after you close is $100,000. 12 to 24 month reserves, full documentation, CPA letter. You know, these are all the things to protect the bank when they lend to say someone that's outside of the, the United States, they have to bring money into the United States and the requirements by the building could be a little bit different. If it's a resale, obviously no bulk investors. So in other words, if an investor says, I wanna buy and it's 10% of the units. So if, you, if you're in a, you know, we have a co-op right now that is 10 units. So if they buy two units, an investor buys two units, first of all, the co-op wouldn't allow it. This co-op would not allow it. But they bought two units, that's 20% of the building, okay? So the bank wants to make sure that there's no one investor that owns 10% or more of any building. It doesn't matter. And that, that includes sponsor units as well. So a new, new development, they require in some cases 50%, in most cases it's 70% to be closed and or in contract, all right? So we're just gonna run through a couple of tax liabilities as well. Uh, number one, or tax sheltering, you know, obviously talk to your attorney, talk to your CPA, talk to all the people <laughs> that legally can give all of the advice that I'm about to be giving right now. This isn't advice, this is more of just an awareness. I have to protect myself against litigation on this, but 
There, there's a couple of ways to actually protect yourself. The first one is LLCs in New York City. They're kind of, they kind of want to go against that because it's tax sheltering. A couple of reasons why. So number one is the LLC actually takes title, and this is obviously in condos, not in co-ops. Most co-ops, I, I don't think any co-op will allow an LLC to buy the property, but LLCs will buy the condo, and obviously that is shielding the purchaser of any liability when it comes to say litigation and a lot of what a lot of buildings do is they they put an, an entire building in LLCs or they put an entire area so if they have five or six units in the Lower East Side they put those five units into an LLC and the reason being is that if you sue say that that developer or that owner only those five units and not the other LLCs could be potentially liable to you know, uh, repayment or to be taken away from them. In other words, if, they, if they're being sued for a million dollars and the home values combined are $10 million, obviously they can come back and say, okay, you gotta sell one of those properties to pay off, say, this litigation. So it is a tax shelter. It is a, and obviously, again, talk to your um, CPA. And then regards to claims stemming from ownership. So this is one of the biggest things is that it passes through the LLC. Obviously, LLC is a little bit different. They pass through to the individual tax rate of the individual instead of a corporate tax. LLC is created obviously of an operating agreement. You have publication, so the publication means that, you know, it's it's silly. When I started my, my LLC, it's in New York City. Some people do in Delaware because of the tax savings and everything else, but obviously I'm operating it out of New York City, so I don't want to do it like this. But they're approximately $1,000. You have to actually put it in a publication, in a law publication, and it says, by the way, this new LLC was just formed. It's a silly way of, you know, I won't say anything about the bar or the you know New York State law. The other is offshore companies. Obviously, one of the most popular ones is BVI's British Virgin Islands. So essentially, the the Brit British Virgin Island. I'll go over this really quick. So essentially, the the name of the LLC is a non-entity. So in other words, the the British the BVI. That's the best way to say it. The BVI actually purchases and is the sole owner of the LLC. I'm not as familiar, so this is someone that would, that would go to an estate attorney, offshore attorney. So in other words, I wrote down here, you will be the members of the, the company which owns the LLC outright. So in other words, the, the BVI is actually purchasing it. Obviously, the, the offshore tax benefits are insane. Let's just go down it. Your client's income liability for the, the rent roll is not charged if the the um, offshore is the sole member of your client in your client um, in other words the buyer uh, who is the individual so in other words here's the property the BVI owns it okay or the BVI starts the LLC which owns it so there's a multitude they avoid paying the estate tax in many of the the instances the offshore company helps in paying uh, not only the assets because that's the only asset that it owns so that you know you have offshore you have LLCs that's that's the best way and then obviously the individual can also buy it if they're a uh, foreign national foreign investor I should say so the last thing I'll go into with actually looking out at uh, the amount of money you're gonna make. So over the last 20 years, 6% has been, even through the recession, even through the incredible times of say 2003 to about 2006, and then obviously it started slowing down and then it stopped and then it has skyrocketed. So 6% year over year compounding has been the, the rate in which uh, most, peop most homes have gone up. Obviously, Long Island City, Brooklyn, Upper Manhattan has gone up at a significant rate. This is obviously across the board. This isn't uh, obviously neighborhood specific, but the best way to, as an investor, if you're gonna be living there, or if you just want to you know, pump money into the United States because you're worried about your local economy, wherever that is, it could be in Europe or UK or something like that, the best way to actually do it is if you want to rent it out, there's two ways of doing it is I care about the cash flow. Obviously, yes, everyone cares about the cash flow. You have to have low monthlies, probably pay cash, and then all that, you know, say the three, four, five percent cap rate is what they're looking for. The other way is just say, listen, I want to just leave this here for 10 to 15 years because I'm worried about my local economy. These are some of the, the, the costs that you have to be considerate about. The closing cost, which obviously then goes into the monthly costs 
which then come into your taxable basis. So in other words, when you sell it, obviously there's FERPTA. FERPTA is the foreign real estate property tax something or other, but it's, it's you have to withhold 10% of the amount of money that you sell it for in case there is tax implications that you owe, whether that's during the ownership or after the ownership. So before you can actually retain 100% of the, the funds and send this wherever you're gonna send it, BBI, the LLC, or outside of the country, you have to withhold due to the IRS. And, and this is obvious because a lot of people would sell it and they owe taxes and then there was no recourse from the IRS. So they now withhold 10% of the home's value, I'm sorry, 10% of the sale value. So I know this was a little complicated. There's, there's three people that you need to talk to. The first one is an attorney that understands foreign, not only foreign investing, but they know how to start and protect you LLC for tax implications, for liability reasons, and then BVI, whether, obviously talk to your attorney on that, and obviously your accountant. That should be kind of a, a rolling conversation when it comes to monthlies, what's the best way to shelter me from taxes and obviously liability because I'm overseas in case something happens, I get into uh, litigation, are they gonna reclaim my property? Or are they gonna take my property? You know, things like that. Are they gonna bring my property against me? There's, there's a multitude of reasons. And the third person is obviously a real estate agent when they're going into a condo or co-op, a sponsor sale or not a sponsor sale, a condop or a new development. Obviously new developments have been extremely popular on the high end, that's extremely high end. Has kind of slowed down-ish. If you're looking at Billionaire's Row, there's still uh, a decent amount of property. There was a, an article that came out about four months ago and they said they had about six and a half years of inventory to be absorbed on Billionaire's Road that's coming online. So that is a lot of property. However, it's a great area for international people and investors to invest in New York City. Highly recommend New York City over other areas. And this is what I'll leave you with because LA, LA has a booming development kind of like in New York and in Miami. So those are really the three big cities. Then you have smaller ones like say Seattle, Austin, Boston, Chicago. There's a couple other cities, even smaller remote areas that, you know, uh, a little bit of Portland, not as much. Obviously San Francisco is extremely expensive, but they're not building as much. But if you talk about really where they're building, say LA, Miami, New York, New York is the only area, and I'll leave you with this, is that New York is the only area where two thirds which is a massive percentage, two thirds of all the property is actually owned by primary residents. So what does that mean? That means that when each recession hits or each market recorrection, however you wanna say it, as each mar market recorrection happens, what typically happens is the person that's renting in the unit, say it's an investor, renting in the unit leaves the home because they lost their job or they're moving somewhere else or they need to downsize or they, they need to, get a bigger unit, whatever, if they leave the home, this home still needs to get paid off monthly by financing or monthly by the condo fees or the maintenance fees. In New York City, because most of them are primary residents, we don't get hit as much. Plus we have co-ops that protect all the purchases that say, hey, listen, I know you want 100% financing. Obviously that's kind of gone away or I know 100 10% financing because of the construction loan or whatever the case is. Cobs protected us. In Miami, it's I think one third are primary residents. So in other words, most of them are second homes or most of them are actually investment units. When a recession hits, those are the first homes to go on the market, the, the investors or the second homes, because the people that live in the home are not the ones that are selling, it's the investors. So it floods the marketplace, especially in Miami. Miami got crushed in 2009, LA a little bit, but there was a couple of areas that were just ground zero for foreclosures out in California. And the reason being is, is there was a lot of investors that, that came in, they pumped money into there, and then they foreclosed on their property, and then it was just a swath of inventory, short sales, foreclosures that hit the marketplace. So New York City, I'm a little biased, but New York City is the best place to be pumping in your investment dollars if you're international. And I, I just believe in real estate in general. So instead of the market or low index funds or annuities or, or bonds or stocks or anything else, securities anywhere else, real estate where you can physically feel, obviously co-op, it's, it's a little bit different in, in their, you know, it's a shareholder and everything else, but 
If you physically buy a condo, you can see it, you can feel it, you can touch it, you can do whatever you want. In other words, renovating, renting it out, do I live there? So highly recommend you, you talk to an accountant, talk to your attorney that specialize in this so they can obviously talk about a little bit more on the legality behind it and then obviously the real estate agent once you start uh, shopping, all right? So if you guys have any questions, leave in the comments below. As always, uh, charles at botanston.com. Have an amazing day. Talk to you guys soon.